Thank you very much for the kind introduction. I'm honored to be here in Paris. It's great to uh, talk here at the ENS. So I want to talk about my long-time love affair with the atomic force microscope. And first, I want to say where I am now. So now I'm in Regensburg. It's about one hour north of Munich. It's very easy to find on the map because 2,000 years ago, Marc Aurelius thought that there needs to be a Roman fortress at the most northern point of the Danube. And that's where our city is located. And our city is much, much older than Munich, for instance. But the university is only about 40, 50 years old. So we celebrate our 50th birthday next year. And uh, my group is quite international. Actually, Professor Rep and myself, we are doing scanning probe microscopy in Regensburg. And uh, we have a, a continuous flow of ambitious and very talented young students who help us to explore into the realm of, of nanoscience. And to start my talk, I want to flash back to a conference which I call like the Woodstock of scanning probe microscopy in 1991 in Switzerland. So Christoph Gerber had, had organized a meeting. I think there were 1,000 participants in Interlaken. And Heini Rohrer, the co-inventor of STM who passed away three years ago, he gave a, an exciting talk about the origin of the scanning tunneling microscope. So I, I hope the audio works. Now, I think there's an extra microphone which I will just put on my speaker here. Is, it, is that working? Yes, working? It's working, okay. So here is... Hmm. Oh yeah, okay. When we had the first set of curves, we get visual image processing, that means taking some of the curves away <laughs> and taking some more of curves away, we finally ended up with the two first STM curves and after a month or two we also could calibrate um, the horizontal axis. So maybe that was the birth. Uh, some people didn't consider it this way because then by May 29th we submitted the paper and as you can read in the comments of the uh, referees it wasn't found to be very interesting. <laughs> Actually one found it interesting but not very physical. <laughs> so, <laughs> they didn't know of Gerd's image processing. <laughs> So in this paper, on this, this slides, Heine was reporting about the first demonstration of vacuum tunneling, where you have a vacuum gap between a physical tip and a flat surface. And that was really the key for the operation of the scanning tunneling microscope. And he was, he was stating, I mean, he, you, showed, you, you could see some, some uh, curves had a very nice exponential slope I, in the next uh, slide you can see the ideal yellow curve here which is a factor of 10 of current increase for every angstrom of distance decrease so if the tip gets closer by one angstrom the tunneling current rises by a factor of 10 now uh, the curves the experimental curves on the right side as you just have seen as Heine has outed Gerd as, as taking away the data which didn't fit so there were a few, a few curves which had a flat, uh, a flat slope. And the origin of that was probably dirt on the tip or on the sample. So experimentally, it was very demanding to have this very clean tunneling gap, but they could demonstrate that they could get that. And the, the, the consequence of that is, if you now imagine my hand as, a, as a, a model for a tunneling tip, you can see my middle finger reaches out the furthest. So if there is one atom sticking out from the tip, by say half an, half an atomic diameter further than the, all the other ones, then this one atom carries 10 times more current than the other ones. And that's the origin for the extremely high spatial resolution. Now the monotonic dependence here is the origin of the relative ease of establishing a feedback loop. Because 
The advantage of this yellow curve is you can just say, okay, my set point is now one nanoamp. And if my actual current is larger, I just advise the feedback to, to pull back the tip. If the current is smaller, I advance the tip. And that's very easy for a distance control. So all you need is a logarithmic amplifier and you have a, a wonderful linear feedback signal which controls distance and uh, current. So in 1986, Gerd and Heine were rewarded with a Nobel Prize. And the, one of the most, I guess, one of the very important cornerstones for that was they could demonstrate for the first time the surface structure of silicon. So the silicon 1117 by 7 reconstruction has a huge unit cell. It, 200 atoms roughly are involved in a rearrangement. So if you, if you, if you break a silicon crystal, the 111 plane is a natural cleaving, cleavage plane. And if you apply a little bit of heat, it, this surface will rearrange uh, to minimize the number of dangling bonds, to minimize the free energy. And then the pattern which emerges has been known for quite a while by lead to have a seven by seven symmetry. So it's a huge unit cell, but the arrangement of the atoms on the surface was not known. And this STM picture here really helped to identify the actual structure. So then in the same year when Binnig and uh, Rora got the Nobel Prize, Binnig, Quaid and Gerber proposed a new instrument which would no longer rely on tunneling. And it would heal one of the drawbacks of the scanning tunneling microscope that you need an electrically conductive surface. So the atomic force microscope was born and the idea was here to put between a non-conducting surface and the tunneling tip a cantilever which in this case was just a thin a piece of gold foil which had a diamond tip at the end. That was a force sensor here and this would allow you to image not just conductors but also all surfaces. And although they could not demonstrate atomic resolution, they still gave it the title Atomic Force Microscope. And in this year, in, in, in this time I was working, I was a student at, at the ETH for one year. I did a break in my TU München studies and I overheard in the hallway that the STM was invented in Rishikon. I sent an application to work there as a summer student and I was working on Brillouin spectroscopy. And on the last day of working there, my boss uh, told me that Binnig was just now in Stanford working on this force microscope, but he would return and start a group in Munich if I would be interested to join. And I said, of course, yes. And indeed, half a year later, Binnig called me and said, oh, uh, you should join my group in Munich. You should finish your diploma as fast as possible. I can't have you as a diploma student. We are starting a new lab. In a diploma, you only have one year to finish your thesis. But for a PhD, it would be great. And he offered me three projects. One would have been to search for gravity waves, building a tunneling detector. And this has not been successful yet. <laughs> they needed a four kilometer big device to do that. And it took almost until now. The other one would have been to sequence the DNA with the scanning tunneling microscope to read the bases. And this also hasn't been done really in, in a convincing quality so far. And the third one was the easiest to just get atomic resolution with a force microscope. So the force microscope, we now have, this paper now has more than 9,000 citations. There are uh, an estimate of 15,000 force microscopes on the planet now, probably even more. And this, uh, just a month ago, the Kabli Prize was awarded to Gerd Billy, Christoph Gerber and Calvin Quaid. And uh, it was a fantastic ceremony. So here you can see them on stage where Pr uh, Crown Prince Håkon presented the awards to them. And Gerd also invited us to celebrate with him, which was of course fantastic to meet all our great colleagues here again. Now, when Binnig invented the force microscope. Actually, he wrote a patent for it, and then with Gerber and with Quaid together, they worked on the implementation. They worked on, on building the real machine. It was clear to him that it should resolve the silicon 7x7. If, the, if it would perform that, 
then that would demonstrate the force microscope is a tool for surface science. And during my PhD time, I did not succeed in, in getting that. What I succeeded in during the PhD was to, to image an inert sample, potassium bromide. It's much less uh, uh, difficult because it's, it's rather inert compared to a reactive silicon surface. So what we lacked in the force microscope were two things. First, on the signal side, we don't have this beautiful exponential decay of our imaging signal with distance. And on our instrumental side, this piece on the right is just a current to voltage converter. It's just an operational amplifier with a resistor that's enough to measure tunneling current. It's very simple. It costs a few dollars. It, or euros. I mean, it's, uh, you can get very good amplifiers for, for, for two euros or so. And that's all you need to measure this tiny current which flows through a simple atom. If you then ask, what do you require to measure the force between an atom and a neighboring atom? That is just much more demanding. And I want to uh, show you, demonstrate a little bit why that is. So first, uh, we don't have this nice exponential dependence and we have a lot of background force. So the first point which was needed to solve that problem was to transform the way forces were measured in the initial publication on the AFM. So rather than having a spring and measuring the deflection of the spring, we would vibrate the spring. If you ask, which signal, which, which quantity can you measure at the greatest precision? There is time and frequency. So this is, these are the quantities which can be measured by far with the greatest precision. So one idea is, rather than measuring a constant deflection, oscillating that lever, and that is the frequency modulation uh, technique. So here you can see a, an oscillating cantilever, and you can view this as a harmonic oscillator. It's characterized by a stiffness K and an, a mass M. And it's easy to imagine if you have a force acting on that vibrating cantilever, that force can be modeled as an additional spring. So in the end, you have a, slightly modif a slight modification. You have an oscillator with two springs. The only point, if you vibrate it as a, at an amplitude as shown here, of course then this KTS, this tip sample spring constant, will not be a constant. It will vary dramatically, of course. But some average um, change will happen and the frequency will change. So what you need to do is you need to apply a positive feedback to the cantilever to make it vibrate at a constant amplitude and you just read out the frequency. And you can show, it's very easy to show, that the frequency change in this case is given by the eigenfrequency divided by twice the spring constant uh, multiplied by the force gradient between tip and sample. So the force divided by its range lambda. But that's only true if the amplitude is small. Only if the, amplitude, if the force gradient stays constant during the oscillation cycle. If that's not the case, then it's actually uh, much, much worse, but that uh, was not clear initially. So using the frequency modulation technique, in summer 94, I could show that one can do the, the imaging of the silicon 7x7. The quality was not great here, so it was only a small strip with a clear picture. And what was really strange were the operational parameters. It was done in frequency modulation mode. On the right-hand side, you can see a silicon cantilever. It's a so-called piezo-resistive cantilever. It changes its resistance when you bend it. That's uh, very helpful if you work in vacuum because the, to align a tunneling tip to the end is very cumbersome and, and uh, prone to errors. So this cantilever was vibrating at an enormously large amplitude of, of 34 nanometers. I didn't know back then why it was required. I, I played around, I tried small ones, didn't work. I listened to the frequency shift. In fact, I first heard the atoms before I saw them. 
because uh, Binnig already trained me in, in the STM also. You, see, you have your headset and you are just one with your machine. You just listen to the signal and, and then you have, the, you have this vibrating cantilever. You slowly approach to the surface and you listen to the frequency shift. And what you hear is then from the slow scan of vroom, vroom, vroom. And then once you get close enough to see the atoms, there's a metallic, a very bright ring, ring, ring. And that's when you know, that's when I knew something is happening now. And when I used to small amplitudes, it was always like something bad was happening, some, some instabilities happened. So although this, this huge amplitude was strange, it was a working scheme. And a lot of people used it. So exciting stuff had been done. For instance, from Japan, there were two very exciting developments in the group of Saizo Morita. They demonstrated atomic manipulation at room temperature. Eigler had done that at low temperature, but they managed to push tin atoms around on a semiconductor surface by the cantilever, by the force of the cantilever. And they also showed that if you have a surface of, of group four materials, the base was the substrate was germanium, and then some of the surface atoms of the germanium atoms were replaced by other group four elements, by tin and lead. And they could distinguish these atoms by their maximum attractive force. So it's a nice demonstration what you can do. But I left actually, after this silicon 7x7 result, I left science and I left as a big question mark in, in figure number four in that paper, I showed a one-to-one -one image of the amplitude compared to the size of the atom. So if we now have this as, as the size of an atom, and this is my tip atom, the amplitude which was required here was on this scale approximately, I would say probably about uh, five meters. So it had to come from a distance of five meters. Now we know the chemical reaction which creates the contrast only happens in the last half atomic diameter or so. So the cantilever was not seeing the sample for most of, the uh, of, of its travel. And the question at that time was unknown why that was so. Now, when you figure out the mass behind the frequency shift, it turns out if you have a large amplitude, the frequency shift is given by this formula here, 0 0.4 times the eigenfrequency divided by stiffness divided by amplitude to the power of 1.5. And then instead of the force gradient, we have the force times the square root of the interaction length. And that is really bad news. That's bad news for the sensitivity to short range forces. Because if you want to probe a chemical force, the chemical force of course has a very small lambda. And that's if, if you compare that to the force gradient where you divide the force by the, by the interaction lengths, you see that this is not good for getting great resolution. So if we now look at this slightly complicated graph, Again, the red curve corresponds to the tunneling current. That's a nice factor of 10 for every angstrom. So every 100 picometers, we get an increase of current by a factor of 10. We have the nice monotonic dependence. The black curve now shows you the van der Waals force. So usually the, the van der Waals force dominates the force in a tip sampling direction. So if you have a relatively blunt tip, and you bring that close to the surface, you have a huge van der Waals background force. And then you have another attractive force component, this blue one here, which has a similar slope as the tunneling current. It's also about a factor of 10 per angstrom. And then if you get even closer, you get the green curve, that's a repulsive interaction, and it has roughly half the decay length. So the net force is the yellow curve here. And you can see that it's always just a small part of the total force. This is in the, uh, it's even worse in the large amplitude case. Now if you could manage to measure a force gradient, you have to take the slope and you will immediately see the slope of the black curve would be very small in that case. The slope of the blue curve would already be much bigger and the slope of the green curve, the repulsive part, would really be big. <laughs>
Now the question is, how can you get into the fourth gradient regime? And the answer is, you have to use a very small oscillation amplitude. And this idea came to me when I had already quitted physics. So I was working as a management consultant in Munich. And um, I did a lot of benchmarking studies. So we were trying to uh, find out. We had a client who, had, who built lighting systems. And they had a huge inventory on expensive aluminum and copper foils. And we were visiting, doing a functional benchmarking with the winner of the German Logistics Prize. They had to pay so much interest at that time. It was 4% interest, not zero like now. And our client lost a lot of money because of that. They had this expensive uh, millions for millions of euros uh, stocks of, of these expensive foils. And we said, let, let's do a benchmark with the best logistics company, which was Zeiss eyeglasses. They could bring the eyeglass in 24 hours to the customer. And then it dawned on me, I never did a benchmarking with the watchmakers. I mean, measuring frequencies and as a force microscopist, we just built, we just used silicon cantilevers. And the reason why we use silicon cantilevers, in my view, is purely historical accident. I mean, Gerd Binnig was in, in Calculate Group in Stanford. And in the heart of Silicon Valley, people process silicon. Mm -hmm. And they built small, stuff out of silicon. And that's why they thought, OK, let's just build a force sensor out of silicon. But you don't really ask, is that the ideal way? Or at least we didn't back then. And then I thought, OK, maybe there's a chance. And so in the 70s, there was this huge revolution in the watch industry, where all of a sudden, very cheap and very precise watches came out. And these watches are built on quartz, are, are based on quartz. You can see a transparent mod model here. So in this metal can here on the left, there is a, a evacuated little vacuum. If you open the can, you find the quartz tuning fork. It's a single crystal quartz. It's metallized with this gold metal for, uh, cover here. And it's, the, the advantages are that it has a very great frequency stability. So these watches, if you put them between about 8 and 40 degrees centigrade, they keep time within one second per day. If you would want to achieve that with a silicon cantilever, the same precision, you would need to keep that silicon cantilever within 0 0.3 degrees. And another benefit is, it's piezoelectric, so it's very easy to read out the deflection. And my question was, can I transform this into a force sensor? And the changes would be that the stiffness would go from roughly 20 newtons per meter to 2,000 newtons per meter. That was the type which was used in swatch watches. And the benefit would be that I could reduce the amplitude from 30 nanometers to half an atomic diameter half a hydrogen atom diameter. And the material, not much change, just add a little oxygen. I mean, just get, go from silicon to silicon dioxide in its crystalline form. And then you need a tip. And also, you don't want a coupled oscillator, because a disadvantage for a force sensor, I mean, as a force sensor of a tuning fork, would be that you have in a tuning fork, two coupled oscillators. The reason they use a tuning fork is that the Q value is very high. So the Q value, high Q value, is good for a high precision, but it's also good for little uh, energy loss. So the battery holds on very long if the Q is very high. And that's good for a watch if the battery lasts long. And I wondered, can I retain the high Q? and yet have a single oscillator. Because if I need a tip, I can't put a tip on both ends. And even if I do, if I would balance the mass exactly, once the tip interacts, I cannot really mirror the interaction on the other end. So the, the solution was, I just put one of the prongs to, a, to an infinitely heavy substrate. So ra the, la, rather than oscillating like this, they would oscillate like, like this. And you can already see from the motion of my upper border, body, there needs to be some compensation. And that's why I need a support mass. So if I support this somewhere and put it on a, on a heavier substrate, then I can have a nice and linear 
vibration. And with that, you have a few benefits. You have this very high frequency stability with temperature, shown on the right top image. And still, the, the remaining question, and the remaining question I could, uh, re I could resolve in my home laboratory at that time in Munich during being a consultant, and that was how large is the amplitude? In a, in a watch, the amplitude is about five micrometers. Can we bring it down to an angstrom or less? And this was positive. So on the bottom right figure, you can see the Brownian motion or the Brownian excitation, not, I shouldn't call it Brownian, the thermal excitation of the prong just by sitting at room temperature, corresponding to an, to an amplitude of about one picometer. And you can still see that one picometer in the noise here. So you can, the signal to noise ratio with a very simple amplifier. Here you can see the electronic scheme. We just have a current to voltage amplifier. We don't need any optics. We don't need a tunneling tip to measure that deflection. We can see that in the electrical signal, the, the deflection. Now today they look a little bit different. Today we have this custom made devices uh, what, what, which I have dubbed Q plus sensors and they only have one prong to start with. They also have separate service electrodes to make it easier to co combine STM. Okay, now using that in 2000, we looked at silicon again, getting a much nicer picture, but seeing something totally surprising. The add atoms, which what's blown up here, should be a single SP3 lobe sticking into the vacuum. So it should be perfectly symmetric with respect to rotations around the Z axis. And our interpretation was that we are imaging two orbitals at the front atom of the tip. So every silicon atom has this SP3 uh, uh, lobe sticking out of the surface. This is now the surface and this is the SP3 lobe. And our tip has two dangling bonds. So that's why every single add atom appears as two uh, individual maxima. Okay. Now, the, our scientific or, yeah, peers were very skeptical about that. I mean, it was a factor of 100 in the stiffness. We went a factor of almost 100. Uh, 100s in the amplitude, it was totally different. People, some people were highly skeptical about that. And from the peers of the non-contact AFM group, nobody was really interested in even trying it. They just were skeptical. The only people who were interested were the scanning tunneling microscopy community. So there were two very famous groups. One, Andreas Heinrich in IBM Almaden, who took over Don Eigler's lab and the second Gerhard Meyer at IBM Rüschlikon. And they were willing to try it out. And so in Eigler's group, we were having a very simple question, how much force is needed to drag an atom across the surface? Because while Eigler could show how you can move the atom, he couldn't show how much force it takes to move them. And so we changed Eigler's famous low temperature STM, just replacing the iridium tip which would be here by a Q plus sensor. And it only took a few weeks. I spent seven weeks at that time in, in Almaden. And then we could measure, uh, uh, to do a very interesting experiment where we asked how much force do we need to drag this atom across the surface. And the way we did that is on figure A, you can see the trace. This is the trace which the tip had to go in order to drag the red atom across the surface. Now in every scan, we went from left to right, and then we, we, we went back, and then we advanced by five picometers, and then went again, and then again going closer, closer, closer. And on every scan line, you could see the frequency shift on, this, on figure D here, on the center or top, and all of a sudden at the at a low enough distance, when you drag the tip, all of a sudden the, the atom would drag along. And from the data, we could integrate the energy and we could take a lateral derivative to measure the lateral force. And that allowed us to uh, 
determine that it takes 200 piconewtons to pull a platinum, uh, sorry, a cobalt atom across a platinum surface. We also tried other element, other atoms and other substrates. It's of course depending on the substrate and the atom. Now, in the collaboration with, with Rishikon, we looked on a different place, again, redoing an STM experiment, a very famous STM experiment. So in, in the early 2000s, Yasha Rep and co-workers had found out that if they put a gold atom on a thin potassium chloride layer, they could charge the gold atom. They could charge it negatively, and if they charge it negatively, the gold atom sinks into the potassium chloride surface, so that it sits on top of chlorine, which is surprising. And then if it's charged, it changes, it distorts the lattice. And we redid this experiment with the additional channel of measuring the forces. And you can see something very interesting. First, let's look at figure B here. This is a so-called topographic image of the surface showing an uncharged gold atom on the left and a charged one on the right. And as you can see, the charged one appears a little bit lower in the height than the uh, neutral one. Now in figure C, we do a so-called constant height experiment, which means we, we uh, scan the tip at a constant height and we see a larger signal on the uncharged gold atom compared to the charged one. The reason is the charged one is lower in the surface, it's further away, therefore the current is smaller. But surprisingly, on that constant height experiment, the frequency shift was more negative on the atom which was further away. So the origin was that there is an additional force. There's not just a chemical interaction, there's also an additional force. And this additional force would be, for instance, the electrostatic force, which will change if you have a charged object. And this we further verified by using a, doing a Kelvin parabola on the charged atom and on the uncharged atom. And as you can see, the apices of the Kelvin parabolas are indeed shifted. Now later on, the Maya group did something which became even much more important. They found out that if they pick up a carbon monoxide molecule on the tip and they image organic matter, here a pentacin molecule, they get an incredible resolution. So the figure B here shows you the STM result and figure C shows you the AFM result where in the AFM you can now really see the chemical bonds. You have an incredible resolution and it's a clear uh, example where the force microscope uh, succeeds, uh, is, is much superior in spatial resolution to the uh, tunneling microscope. It's important to ask what is the imaging contrast here due to? It's Pauli repulsion, Nikolai Moll, the theorist from the group, has shown that it's Pauli repulsion which creates that very sharp uh, uh, data. And it's a very, right now the CO tip is, is the best tip we have right now for doing this organic matter uh, resolution. I want to briefly show you now some examples of what we do in Regensburg. So the first thing is a method which we have dubbed Kofi carbon monoxide front atom identification. That's our low temperature microscope. It's a commercial Omicron one of them. We have, we have a, a home built as well. And it has um, also, we also have a field ion microscope which we don't use anymore because this Kofi method has really replaced that. And let me explain to you what, what I mean by Kofi. It's known for a long time that carbon monoxide adsorbs on copper in a perpendicular fashion. It sits on top of a copper atom. It's nicely perpendicular and it's like a needle probe for our front end of the tip. So if we do this experiment which is shown on the right side where we take constant height data and get closer and look at the data as a function of distance, we can learn a lot about the structure of our tip. So I want to show you a movie where we are looking at 40 frames spaced by 10 picometers, 
So instead of three different, uh, uh, we have 40 roughly. And every, every frame is 10 picometer closer. And we can look in parallel at the tunneling current and at the frequency shift. So because we, these two channels are totally separated, we can look at them individually. So here, let's see what happens. Initially, the, you see a dip in the tunneling current. And as we get closer, we get more contrast in the frequency shift. At this minimum height of zeta, uh, zero picometers, that's uh, the minimum we chose here. If we would have gone any closer, we would have dragged the carbon monoxide to the side. And that's very interesting what you can see here. If you watched the movie, the left side did not change much. I mean, the contrast is stayed the same. All that changed were the numbers on the, on the bar here. So the current in nanoamps has changed over about uh, three and a half orders of magnitude. But uh, the contrast itself stayed pretty much the same. It was much different in the frequency shift. If you remember the first, I, I will show it again, I think. Um, let's, let's look at it again. So initially, the frequency shift image is very blurry, very fuzzy. As we get closer, you see that the contrast starts to become better. And also, the signal to noise ratio becomes better. But the current picture basically did not change. Now, there's a, a few very interesting things we see here. First, the circle, which indicates the atom, is much smaller on the frequency shift channel than on the current channel. And second, on the frequency sh shift channel, we see four more bright bumps up here. So these, these four here, these are atoms from the second tip layer. So we can see not just the front atom, but also the atomic layer behind the front atom. And in this case, we had a tip which had only a single front atom. Now first we can ask, why is it that we get a much better spatial resolution by the force microscope than by the tunneling microscope? And it's also interesting to note the scale of the frequency shift. So here you see that the, the contrast is, is roughly as big as the signal itself. So on the red background area, we have minus 25 hertz. And on the blue center, we have more than minus or less than minus 40 hertz. So this shows you, in this case, the force was, uh, the, the tip was relatively blunt. So we had a very strong van der Waals force on the order of, I think it was about 10 nanonewtons here. And this short range force, which causes all the contrast, is only a few hundred piconewtons. That shows you how the small amplitude really magnifies these short range interactions. And if you now ask, why is it that we have a better spatial resolution, then this figure is probably helpful. If we ask, what do we see by these two types of microscopes? In the scanning tunneling microscope, we can only tunnel from an occupied state into an empty state. Which means, if we look at the occupied electronic levels in the solid, we can only address the upper shell by the STM. If we, are, okay, if we have the, the energy to the bottom, we can only really look at the upper fringe of the occupied states. And these are the ones with, with the highest energy, and they have the largest spatial variation. Whereas, if we are able to bring two bodies so close to each other that, they're, that we see uh, even in the, in the bands that we see in an energetic change, that means that they are interacting. And that means with the force microscope in the repulsive regime, we can address states which are much lower in energy and which are spatially much more confined. And that is the key why the force microscope allows us a greater spatial resolution. Now we use that to look at clusters, for instance. There's a publication from the Wiesendanger group where they pushed these five iron atoms on the figure A. You can see these, oops, 
these five iron atoms, they are pushed together by atomic manipulation to a cluster. In the STM, all you see from these five atoms is a big heap. You can't see, resolve any structure inside. They use density functional theory to come up with two potential candidates. Now we can use the force microscope to really look at them. This is the picture you get from a force microscope with a CO tip. You can see that the, the proposition in figure D is actually at least occurring in reality. And we looked at other clusters here. On the first row, on the left row, you can see a dimer. In the STM, the top row shows you the STM data. All you see is a different height. In the STM, the dimer in the, in the left, the trimer in the center, and the tetramere on the right side, they all appear rough, more or less the same. The only difference is the height in the STM. In the AFM, we can not only count the atoms on the clusters, we can also see the substrates. So the copper 111 surface appears, the atoms appear as dark spots in the AFM image. And this way we can also relate the adsorption sites of the, uh, of the cluster. And uh, if we uh, put in the latches of the surface, we can identify the uh, adsorption sites. Now, what you can see here is also a problem. And that is, if you look at the center of this cluster, the spacing is more or less like on the substrate. So what we see here is a cluster of 15, I think it's 15 iron atoms on top of a copper surface. And you see that the fringes of the clusters are washed out a lot. They appear much bigger. And the origin of that is a CO deflection. So this, this great probe, the carbon monoxide terminated tip, it sways a lot to the side. It's very soft uh, to the side. And that creates these uh, aberrations in the image. So <clears throat> we can now also look at silicon again using the CO tip. If you remember the first result from 95, the atoms were pretty much washed out. Then from 2000, we had this split image of the atom, which was caused by the dangling bonds of the front atom. And the bottom image here is now a silicon 7x7 imaged with a carbon monoxide tip. And you can immediately see the apparent size of the atoms is much smaller now. And it's, I mean, the, the size is, is way it, 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 uh, exaggerated with uh, non-CO tips. With CO tips, if we compare now the total charge density of that surface to the experimental image, we see a very good agreement. So on this image, you can not only see the 12 atoms here, in, in one of these diamonds. You can also see on every side there are three so-called rest atoms. So these rest atoms, they are more than one angstrom deeper than the add atoms. And this, the sharp CO pre probe, can be, it's basically like this here. We have this so-called rest atoms down here, and our sharp CO probe can even probe the rest atoms, which are lower than that. Another example is subatomic spatial resolution on the sample. So if you look at a copper atom, it, the contrast we get depends on the distance. Initially, at a relatively large distance, we see this attractive black spot here. If we get closer, we see a, a torus. The torus becomes sharper. And in the end, the torus has even a little cusp inside. That's for copper. For an iron atom, we also see a torus shape. But the torus has three local maxima on the, on the top of the torus. So that's the apparent shape of a single iron atom as probed by a CO molecule uh, tip. Another example is spin contrast. So does spin play a role in this contrast? And there's a very uh, famous example that's uh, nickel oxide. So nickel oxide is an antiferromagnet. It has a rock salt structure, just like rock salt. It cleaves on one zero zero planes. If you cleave it, 
every second row of nickel has the same spin orientation, but the rows in between have the op opposite spin orientation. So the spins in nickel oxide are, are parallel on one, one, one planes. You can see these planes in the red and green here. And already in <clears throat> 2007, the Wiesenlanger group could show that you can get this spin resolution using a thin layer of iron on the silicon cantilever, but they also had to apply a five Tesla field, and they had to do unit cell averaging to get the data. So if you look at figure A and B, these are the raw data. If you do unit cell averaging, you can see that every second row is a little bit lower than the first. We now use this, our small amplitude technique, and we use bulk magnetic tips. This is now a, a little bit low pass filtered, but it's not unit cell average, this picture. And you can immediately see that every second row here is darker. And you, you can see it especially in the fast Fourier transform image here, that we have these extra peaks here, which indicate the spin contrast. If you use a, a slightly different um, color scheme, you can even see that the oxygen atoms have a slightly different height. They, every, every other row is about 300 femtometers lower than the other, which points to super exchange. And what we could also do is we could do spectroscopy, force spectroscopy, so we could measure the absolute forces that act here showing that the spin-dependent part only amounts to five piconewtons. Now, we can also use the technique to do atomic identification. So here, we now are looking at various tips. So there are four tips on A, B, C, D. These are the Kofi images of four different tips. And we, in the center of these black spots, we are doing F, force versus distance spectra. And you can imagine if you have this, this uh, sample atom, and I, I use my toys again here. So let's assume this is now our CO tip. That's the oxygen of the CO tip. And this is our unknown tip. And now we do a F force versus distance spectrum. So we get initially attraction. And then once we get too close, we get a repulsion again. So there's a force minimum. And you can see these force minima in figure E here. And that force minimum depends on the chemical species. We have a very well-defined sample situation. We have a carbon monoxide molecule on the flat copper surface. So that's an, uh, an absolutely uh, well-defined situation. And our second uh, bonding partner is not so well-defined. So now we prepared a pure copper tip. And the pure copper tip gave us a minimum force of 150 piconewtons. Then we used an iron tip, a pure iron tip, which was cleaned by field emission and so forth. And this iron tip yielded a, a force minimum of 260 piconewtons. If we only put a single copper atom on this iron tip, we again end up at 150 piconewtons. So we can determine what is the front atom, what is the chemical identity of our front atom here. OK, another nice combination, again going back to scanning tunneling microscopy. So there is a nice application of scanning tunneling microscopy or extension called inelastic tunneling spectro spectroscopy. And there's a big question in this inelastic tunneling spectroscopy. What you do in inelastic tunneling spectroscopy, you have the tip and the sample again. And you notice that once the energy of the tunneling electrons is big enough, you can excite some motion, some vibration. In this case, it's a carbon monoxide molecule. And if the, if the energy of the electrons is big enough, we can get this molecule to vibrate laterally. And we see that in a peak here in the, in the so-called DIDV signal. Now it turned out with some tips, you get a very good signal to noise ratio, like the red one here. With other ones, like the blue, you get a very lousy signal to noise ratio. You, get, you don't get a strong IETS signal. 
and we could identify why that is with the force with combining this with force microscopy because although the images here of the two tips look the same in the STM mode, in the AFM mode we could see okay this right tip has a, is a three atom tip, the left one is a single atom tip, this is a three atom tip and the three atom tip doesn't get the same intensity. So using that technique, we could show that for these five different tips, these tips are all, these five tips are all different, but they are all single atom tips. And if you look at the reproducibility of the spectra, it's beautiful. It's really a, a, a nice way to calibrate uh, tips on the, on the atomic scale. Okay, so here, uh, okay, I can skip that. Another application, topological insulators. There was one big question. It's one of these events which why I really like to go to conferences like the Surface Science Symposium where I also met Ari a couple of times that you meet your colleagues and they, propose, they, they pose their problems. So uh, Hugo Dill, who is the last author of this pu publication, he presented this STM data from Hamburg and he said, you look at this data, you have this beautiful, nice atomic steps here. And if you zoom into the surface, it's not, it doesn't look atomically flat anymore. There's something strange going on. There are these warm-like structures. How do, you, uh, how, how do they relate to atoms? Because they are about 1.5 nanometers wide. So we, we said, okay, let's look at that. And we looked at this with combined STM and AFM. Now in STM, we also saw these warms, as you can see here. But in AFM, we got a much sharper picture. And we, we could find out that what happens here is when you break the surface, about 50% of the atoms, of the tellium atoms, stay on one side of the cleavage plane, 50% are on the other. And these remaining 50%, they reform small islands on the order of uh, two or three nanometers wide. And if you count the atoms here, you find out it's about 50%. So if we were to look at the other half, which we can because it falls in the vacuum chamber, it probably would look the same. But that really shows you that is um, what the structure is like of the surface. Okay, another example very recently, we could demonstrate now that we have, uh, can have superconductive tips. It's not trivial because usually in the force microscope, you need some device to measure the deflection. And if you have an optical beam, for instance, the temperature is, is, is rise. And here we could show that our tip is superconducting. You can see by this inset here that the tip is uh, indeed superconductive. The purpose of this study had been to look at a change which has been proposed by the inventor of the Hirsch index, by Jorge Hirsch. So he he. Uh, claim that there is a, that it's possible that we need to use a different gauge in the superconducting states and that would lead to a different screening. So that would change the screening of electrostatic impurities. So what he claimed is that it is possible that if you go from normal conducting to superconductive and you have a charged impurity, that the screening of that impurity will change vastly. So in the normal conducting state, the screening happens at the Thomas Fermi wavelengths. In the superconductive state, it might happen uh, at the London penetration depths, which is 30 nanometers or so, whereas this Thomas Fermi is half an angstrom. So that would be a huge effect. So far we haven't seen that effect, but it could also be caused because we, we only went down to 2.4 Kelvin. So our microscope is still based on helium-4, we are collaborating with the group of Joyce Josio in NIST, who has a 10 millikelvin machine, and the 10 millikelvin machine is currently being rebuilt to be a combined STM and AFM by implementing also the Q plus sensor. So we will do, redo that experiment and see what happens at millikelvin temperatures. Okay, so my last point is going to be lateral force microscopy, where we could measure the lateral stiffness of a CO tip. The, on figure D here, you can see the, the cartoon. We have a metal end at our tip. A carbon monoxide molecule is there. 
And now we want to know how soft is that CO really. And the way we did that is we, we did lateral force microscopy. The reason we did lateral force microscopy is that we wanted to measure the interaction of these two carbon monoxide molecules, one on the surface and one on the tip. And the energy is very, very tiny. It's just a van der Waals attraction. And the depth, as we have measured, is only 8 millivolts, millielectron volts. And the advantage of doing lateral force microscopy is that on a flat surface, there are no lateral long range forces. So that's why the lateral force here is a nice uh, way to, to measure that tiny interaction. And it turned out that, OK, the, the, we can model that by a Morse potential. The depth is about 8 milli electron volts. The decay length is about 47 picometers. That's very similar to the decay lengths in, in metallic tips, for instance. And the equilibrium distance is 385 picometers. <clears throat> but we could also determine that the lateral stiffness of this CO molecule is very small. It's only a quarter of a Newton per meter, which explains these distortions we see in the CO terminated tip images. Now today, the Q plus sensor is used in many microscopes. I think, I think as far as I know now, all commercially available low temperature microscopes use it. And lots of exciting results are coming out every month now. So this is just a nature paper from, I think, last month from the uh, groups of Roman Fasel at EMPA. Klaus Müllen is involved. He did, the, I think, the precursors. And what you can see here are carbon uh, nano ribbons uh, with some uh, attachments to the edges and it's uh, the only way to make that possible is really force microscopy. So uh, <clears throat> with that I want to summarize. So the AFM resolves atoms structures within atoms. That's why we call this subatomic spatial resolution. And we get atomic resolution of, of metal clusters. We can also measure spin contrast, as I've shown you before. And I did not have enough time to talk about ambient AFM. But we are now also using this small amplitude technique based on Q plus to look at ambient surfaces as, as, as surfaces in ambient conditions. This here is a potassium bromide surface. It has been cleaved in air. And it doesn't take long to form a water layer. Just the water and the moisture in the air will absorb on the surface. And it's very interesting what kind, the kind of experiments you can do there. You can poke with a tip. You can drill a hole. And then you can watch it heal again. You scan over it, and you see at every scan it's healed a, a little bit more. And uh, because the, w this water layer, of course, is a saturated solution of, of water plus uh, potassium plus bromide in that case, and you can watch what's happening. If you zoom in on the atomic scale, you can also see the atoms. So with that, I want to thank my co-workers here, my, our funding agencies, and of course you for your kind attention. Thank you. Yes, uh, uh, you, you measure the f lateral force at some point to show, I mean, you showed that you could measure the force to push an atom. So yeah. do you think it could be possible to measure the energy barrier? You know, whenever you have a small object on the surface, so yeah. then you, when you push yeah. it at some point, it will raise and fall again in another yes. well. And, uh, yeah. yeah. So because there it's related to friction and electronic yes. contribution. Yes. And, and that's very interesting because the initial results, which we did with IBM together, they looked like the barrier does not change. I mean, the, the, the diffusion barrier of carbon monoxide on copper, for instance, is known. And the forces were compatible with that diffusion barrier. Now, later experiments done now in, in Regensburg, it turned out that apparently the bond, if you look at, at this adsorbate on the surface, and just the mere presence of the tip changes the strength of the bond here. So it's. I mean, it's, it's uh, easy to imagine from, from quantum mechanics, but it's a totally cla non-classical effect. 
that the presence of the tip will soften that bond. But we see a lot of evidence for that now. First, for the manipulation barriers, they are actually lower than expected from the diffusion barriers. And second, we also look at, uh, now that's also unpublished, where we look at the uh, vibrational energies, and we see that the vibrational energies uh, change with, with distance, not only because of the actual forces which the tip exerts, but additionally there, there must be a bond weakening. So about using the CO tip, uh, do you see any f kind of um, possibility to go beyond? Because there's always this bending, you yes, which you also yes. mentioned. And what is the advantage? Is it because it's uh, kind of st always sticking out? Is that the reason why so CO is so good? So there are a few advantages. So w let's first look at the upside of the CO tip. So number one, it acts as a spacer. So we have this, v this relatively blunt metal tips, and they should be blunt because otherwise they are too floppy laterally. But the CO is like a spacer, which means the van der Waals attraction is much smaller with the CO in between than without the CO. That's one advantage. The second advantage, the CO is built from light elements. So it's, they are small elements. So that's, that's more like a delta function which probes your sample. The third pro advantage is that the oxygen is very non-reactive. So I mean, when the CO bends on the surface, it's a very inert tip. So even on the metal atoms, if you, if you ask how much attraction do you get between two metal atoms, the forces are on the order of nanonewtons. If we ask what is, you could, I, I showed you the examples for copper, we only had a maximum attraction of 150 piconewtons for copper. For iron we had 260, it's still very, very little compared to iron iron, which would be on the order of two nanonewtons or so. So that's, that's a lot of benefits. The only dis, I mean, and even the softness, the lateral softness, is sometimes a little bit of an advantage because it enhances the contrast. But of course it is uh, creating aberration. It creates uh, abnormal images, distortions, and that's not wanted. So a lot of groups are working to find a tip which is better than that. There is a tip. We know there is a tip which is much better. We haven't found it yet. <laughs> and you can help us find it. I <laughs> was uh, curious to hear a little bit more about the ambient um, AFM and what are the limitations compared to the uh, very low temperature ones that you're doing. Okay, so let's see, I have some more slides about that. Let's see. Oh, yeah, here. Okay, let's look at that. Here, that's the basic setup in the ambient condition. We don't put our whole sensor in water. So far, we've only studied water-covered samples here. <clears throat> so our sensor is relatively big, so we can just penetrate that surface layer with a part of the sensor, just with a tip. And if you now, this is now the curves we are getting. They depend on the moisture. So the top curve here is done at a very high relative humidity on the order of 80% where the water layer was very, very thick. So you can see already 10 nanometers out, we see a change in the frequency shift, and we also see a change in the so-called excitation signal. So I, I told you initially when I explained the frequency modulation technique, we are supplying feedback to our sensor to make it vibrate at a constant amplitude. And we can, of course, record how much excitation do we need in order to maintain that constant amplitude. So there is additional damping that shows up as an increased excitation signal. And the, the value out here is about one millivolt. On the bottom, you can see it, one millivolt. It goes up by a factor of 40 here. And if we just use a heat gun and we blow off that water layer and we do another approach, curve in the bottom, you see that the frequency shift curve stays flat until almost hitting the surface. It's al almost like in vacuum. And then you see the attractive part and then the rep repulsive part. And the damping signal doesn't change by far as much. You can see here we, we start out at one millivolt, which would be the same as up here. You can't really see it on that scale. But here it only went up to about three millivolts, a factor of three. And uh, here it went up by a factor of 40. And yeah, so 
Now, these are, is, is a, an image of a poke. Here we created an intentional hole in the surface by just pushing the tip a few nanometers. I mean, we don't know how much it actually penetrated because although the stiffness is 2,000 newtons per meter, it's, it's not infinitely stiff. So uh, we are just uh, surface layer, oops, where is my surface layer by surface layer we are we are uh, creating that hole. But here you can see a time series where you see that this exposed thing here actually is going away and the hole is healing again. So this material is taken from somewhere in exposed areas and going into the, the, the holes after a while. And we also looked at other, I mean this is now atomic, this is now graphene and this is calcite where you see that the contrast depends a lot on the tip polarity. So the green picture is in one tip polarity and the orange one in the other. Thank you. Thank you again. Welcome. Thank you.